please be conscious of what it is. Enjoy your time with your family. Enjoy whatever it is you choose to do. But please, take a moment and recognize those people who've laid it all down and paid the ultimate price for the country that you and I live in. Flawed, yes, but also the best in the world. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. Lord, we thank you because from the beginning, it's as if your spirit is reminding us of who you are. Of who we have in you, of the benefits that you've ordained for us to live in and walk in every day of our lives. And they're traced back to who you are. We thank you for manifesting your presence in this place, for allowing us to not only acknowledge your presence, but to actually feel you here with us. May we never, ever take that for granted, oh God. May we acknowledge daily the privilege of what it is to be called by your name and be called children of the living God. I thank you for everything that's taken place here today, for the way you've, you've spoken, the way you've ministered to your people as they've ministered to you. Now I pray, oh God, that you would equip me and anoint me to minister your word to your people, that you would grant me the ability and the anointing to share the word you've placed on my heart for your people. And I pray for your people, every man, woman, and young person in this place, that you would sow the good seed of your word into their hearts and their lives this morning. Thank you for who you are, and thank you for who you are in this place, and I thank you in advance for what your word will accomplish in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Together we say... Amen and amen. You may be seated. Last time I shared, I shared a very well-known scripture in Isaiah. I had to kind of look back. It was the beginning of May, so it's been quite a while. And there was some points um, that I left towards the end of my message that I, that I thought I would get to a couple weeks after that. But as I shared uh, last week, uh, Pastor Tom went ahead and reconfirmed his date, so that, that was supposed to be my Sunday, but obviously not, didn't care at all. How many of you were blessed last week with Tom and Julie and their life and their testimony? <laughs> what a Sunday. Um, so there were some points that Sunday that I thought I'd get to, um, and obviously I didn't, and I, I want to do that today. I want to finish the message that's entitled, His Thoughts and His Ways. For those of you who do not remember, that life-changing message. I'm going to remind you that it was found in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and verse 9. The Lord speaking says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. Kind of puts things into perspective, doesn't it? Whatever we're thinking, whatever we're planning, God's ways and God's thoughts are so much higher. I like the New Living Translation. It says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. Says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I don't know if you've already come to the following conclusion, but God's plans are nothing like our plans. And how many of you can thank God for that? How many of you have ever planned something out and then God doesn't allow it to take place and you're angry at the beginning? But after some time, you say, man, thank you. thank you, Jesus, thank you that you did not consider my plans and alter your plans for mine. That's happened to me. Raise your hand if that's happened to you. You realize, man, what was I thinking? 
You see, the journey that He has designed for us is far beyond anything we could dream up or imagine. If you've come to know the Lord as your Lord and Savior, then the plans that God has for you, not only are they great, the plans that you think God has for you, they're higher. The journey that you would expect God to lay out for you is higher. Four weeks ago when I was sharing, Abraham was our focus, and he will be our focus today. Um, you know, I, you look at the relationship that God has with people all over the Bible, and, and it's, it's, it's so different. God deals with people differently. God deals with us differently. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that God deals with me the way I need to be dealt with. You look at the way that God dealt with Abraham, his call over his life, and Abraham was a special man of God. But he was a special man of God because of the way he responded to God. And God is the one that chose Abraham. Abraham didn't choose God. God chose a man from a pagan country, from a pagan family. And says, get out. I've got something better for you. Abraham was called by God for a higher purpose. And Abraham had no idea that he would be the one God would choose to bring forth a nation that God was going to choose for himself and call them special. And as Pastor Tom said last week, the Bible says that we are sons and daughters of Abraham because of our faith in Christ. So Abraham's faith was so important that we may not be born into the Jewish culture, but our faith is traced back to the father of the Jews. That's amazing. Turn with me, if you would, to Genesis chapter 15. To see this process unfold in Abraham's life. The way God worked in him, the way God chose him, the way God developed him, the, the, the way God lifted him up, the way God broke him down, the way God just let him be. Genesis chapter 15, we're going to read some verses here. We're going to start in verse 1. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. If you're taking notes, please highlight or underline the word of the Lord came to Abram. And why is that important? I will tell you why. Because once you have received a word from the Lord, you have received everything you need. When you are armed with a word from God, you are armed with everything that you need. God's word serves both as your offense and your defense. God's word protects you and God's word fights for you. Verse 2. But Abram said, you know, after you receive a word like that, you should not see the word but. And God was faithful to me, but. Has that ever happened to you? A highlight of who God is followed by but. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing that I go childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, the one who was born in my house is my heir. You know, I noticed something here recently. Twice. Twice. Abram asked God to consider his situation. To focus on his limitations. Likely in hopes that God would reconsider his thoughts and adjust his ways accordingly. Like, you say you're going to make me a father of nations, but I've got no children. And the one in my house is born of another, and that one is my heir. He says to God the first time, see 
I'm childless. And then he says, look, I've got no children. Twice, Abram wants God to consider his situation. Instead of Abram looking to God for what God has in store for him, Abram is saying, wait, do you see, do you see that I have no children? No, Abram, that's a surprise. I thought you had a house full of kids. <laughs> see, I am childless. Look twice. See and look. You've given me no offspring. I've realized that many times God's promises are out of reach simply because we are focusing on the things we don't have. Many times God's promises are out of reach because our focus is on what's not happening. Many times God's promises are out of reach because we're focusing on what we don't have and we want God to do the same. I'm here to tell you today that God will not do that. God will not dwell on your limitations. God will not alter his ways and his thoughts because of our current situation. God is committed to his thoughts and his plans concerning us. God was telling Abram, I've got something for you. And Abram was saying, but wait, look. How much time have you and I wasted when God promises, when God speaks? And we say, wait, look. God, how can you do this? Look at my situation. God, how can you take this, considering my past, and make something glorious out of it? How can you take the disaster that I am and be glorified through it? Look, God, see. God's not interested. Because he already has thoughts and plans concerning the disaster that is you. And if God would pay attention to your limitations and my limitations and our griping and our complaining, he'd never accomplish anything. That's why God doesn't care about what we don't have. God doesn't care about our limitations. God's care, God's concern is you and the thoughts and the plans that he has concerning you and me. That's what God is concerned about. Verses 2 and 3 were true, weren't they? Was Abraham making this up? No. Were they true? Was Abram's conclusion true? See, I'm childless. Look, I've got no children. Is that a true statement? Yes, but it's also incomplete. It was a true statement. But it was incomplete. Why? Because Abraham had no idea what tomorrow held for him. Had no idea. Yet our defense when we do the same thing is, it's true. It's reality. It's also incomplete. And don't you forget that. Because as long as there is breath in your being, there's an opportunity for God to turn things around. And I'm not being cliche. I hate that. I absolutely hate that. But if you have breath in your being, all God needs is a moment of your attention and this much faith. This much faith. But what do we do? We complain. We cry. God, but you don't know. But God, don't you see? But God, don't you understand? Abraham didn't see, nor did he know what God had in store. We look at Abraham's life and we know what happened, but for a moment, think about an old man who was called out of his house, out of his country. And God appears to him and says, I'm going to give you children. I've been trying, man. Nothing's happened. And when we focus on our incomplete outlook, 
we become frustrated. Anybody here ever been frustrated with God? It's okay. You can confess. Nobody's going to judge you because everybody has. Whoever didn't raise their hand is a liar. If you've been walking with God any amount of time, you've been able to look back and say, what is God doing? How, how does this make any sense whatsoever? And that's when we analyze it with this. But what about when our heart is hurting? What about when we've been scarred, not by the world, but by God himself? When what God has for us is going to create pain. Hello, am I speaking to the right people? Because I'm in the hand of God and I've had some painful experiences in my life. And I know I'm not the only one. But when you and I become frustrated because of an incomplete outlook, that's what the enemy uses to discourage us. To disrupt our walk with God. And ultimately to destroy our faith. Verse 4. Here we go again. And what happened? The word of the Lord came to him again. Underline that. It didn't come one time. It came what? A second time. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one, that person, Eliezer, he's not going to be your heir. But one who will come from your own body, that one shall be your heir. I can imagine Abram there. Like, I'm not 20 years old anymore. My dad tells me that all the time. So, yeah, you don't think I went down. I'm like, Dad, you haven't been 20 since I've been alive. <laughs> Abram no tenía 20 años. In the New Testament, it says that Sarah described him. Does anybody remember? The ladies, I'm sure, will. Do you remember? As good as dead. <laughs> Abram, that man's as good as dead. Can you, can you imagine your wife? That's, that's better than Job's wife that said, curse God and die. Like, that's better. But Sarah described Abram as as good as dead. Now, I think she was lashing out because she was hurting. Because Abraham was able to produce kids and we'll get into that in a little bit you know but she wasn't but Sarah was a knockout even an, an old lady at 90 I'm, and I'm sorry at 90 is old like that's not 90 is not the new 40 <laughs> <laughs> you know the new 40 keeps moving when I was a kid it was 50s and you for now it's like 60 is the new 40 90 is not the new 40 no if I know a 90 year old I say listen era una veterana, but this is that's it that's it you're a 90-year-old woman. At 90, she was turning heads. Imagine that. To put it mildly, una señora mayor. And men, men, men had to have her. She was a knockout. Pastor Tom spoke last week about Rachel and Leah. Remember that? Why do, why do you think Jacob loved Rachel? Because she was a knockout. Leah, the Bible says she had delicate eyes. Her best attribute, she had delicate eyes. Estaba feita. She was... Pobrecita, it's true. She had delicate eyes. That's... I want Rachel. No, I'm going to give you Leah. She's got pretty eyes, man. <laughs> That's probably what he said. Ah! <laughs> when he woke up, then I said, oh, my God. <laughs> Let me see your eyes. <laughs> Let me see your eyes. But he says to Abram, no, no, no. You, the way you're thinking, no, I'm, you're here. I'm so much higher. 
What I've got planned for you is so much higher. The, the, the thoughts that I have for you, they're so much higher. Abram, you are going to have a son. I want to let you know something, that the word of the Lord is key to unlocking his thoughts and his ways for our lives. When you've got a word from the Lord, you've got everything you need. God then asked Abraham for a sacrifice. This is what I'm going to do for you. This is what I want to do. I want to sacrifice. And I want to let you know this today. After the word of the Lord comes to your life, prepare yourself for the sacrifice. Because the sacrifice is what seals the covenant of God over your life. I hear people say all the time, I've given so much. I've given God so much. Good. Because you and I will never be able to repay what's been given for us. Look at verse 11 with me of chapter 15. God gives him promises. He says, I want, I want a sacrifice. So Abraham prepares a sacrifice. And look at verse 11. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. This verse is in there. It's just like thrown in there. It's just like, why was that detail placed there? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. Because when God asks for a sacrifice, he may have that sacrifice sit for a while. And you say to yourself, where's God? What is your response when the vultures arrive? Having had a, a moment with God and all of a sudden you look up and you say, again? The, now again? After all this, after this blessing, after this glory, I have to deal with this? I have to deal with vultures after I've had this experience with God? And God is saying he's going to bless me? He's going to bring a child through me? Now I have to deal with vultures? What do you, what do you do when the sacrifice God asked you for and it took you so long to do it. Raise your hand if God has spoken something to your life and you fight with it and you fight with it and you fight with it. And then you finally do it and God is silent. Does that happen to you? That's what happened to Abram. God asked him for a sacrifice. He did it. And he said, all right, what's going to happen now? God doesn't show up. God doesn't speak. And he looks up and vultures are coming and vultures are landing on the sacrifice. The sacrifice that belongs to who? Belongs to God. Abram didn't say, well, that's God's business. No, no, he took action. There will be vultures that not only circle your life, but that land on the sacrifice that belongs to God. What are you going to do? What will your response be when the sacrifice that God asked for seems to be ignored by God? And the enemy begins to swoop in. Will you fight for and defend your sacrifice? Abram did, and he drove the vultures away. He just didn't sit there. There are going to be times in this life when you are called to wait. How many of you know that's difficult? There's going to be times in this life when you're called to wait, and there will also be times in this life when you are called to take action and defend the sacrifice. Defend what God is asking you for. Verse 16, verses 1 and 2. Things are beginning to move forward now. Abram tells his wife, listen, I don't know if we've been doing anything wrong. I don't know what's happening, but things are going to change. God said he's going to give us a son. Verse 16, chapter 16, verse 1. Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. Fact, reality. But it's also what? Incomplete. But she didn't know that. She looked at her situation and she thought, she thought, I've got to come up with a plan. If you've ever uttered the words, I need to do something, you better stop 
and spend some time in God's presence to find out what it is he wants you to do, if he wants you to do anything at all. Because here, Sarah said, well, God promised you that, and we've produced no children. Were those true statements? True statements. So she had an idea. Thank God Abram didn't come up with this idea. Or he would have to find another wife. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. True statement or not? True or not? True statement. But also incomplete. Or not complete. You can say both, both apply. See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please. That changes things a little bit, right? When your wife asks you, please. Has your wife ever asked you to do something and you don't do it? And then she comes with, please. Right? That changes things a little bit. Kind of, oh, yeah. She says, please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. So Abraham said, absolutely not. I will do no such thing. <laughs> Is that what the Bible says? Yeah. No, he heeded her voice. He looked at her and said, eh, all right. Since you said, please. You see, when things aren't clear, wait on God. Do not allow somebody else's thoughts, somebody else's plans to become your guide. Because God's ways are higher than theirs too. If you're sharing with somebody what's going on in your life, your heart says, I've got an idea. I, for one, don't listen. I don't want to hear your ideas. I want to hear you're praying for me. I want to hear that let's see God together to see what God's going to do. If you are the person that's always coming up with brilliant ideas like Sarah did, you could be digging a pit that's going to take generation after generation to dig out of. Hagar eventually bore Abram a son. His name was Ishmael. Ishmael was Abram's son, but he was not the son that God thought and planned for Abram. God had other plans, and they were higher. They were better. They were superior. And God wanted to use an old man and an old woman to do it, not a young, beautiful maidservant. Verse 3 and 4. Then Sarai, Abraham's wife, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband. Listen, I, you know, I, I kind of just threw it, to, not throw it, to, threw it to the side with this idea, but imagine how difficult that was for that woman. I, she, she just didn't, you know, th that was a plan that she really looked at the situation and thought, there's no other way, as we were singing today. There's no other way. I don't see God being able to do anything here, so, so let me come up. We don't like to think we're helping God out, but that's exactly what we're doing. We think we could help God. That's why we pitch ideas to God, even in our prayers. Lord, if, Lord, if, if you do this. And then we throw the token. Oh, Lord, only if it's your will. But we keep on and we keep on and we keep on. Huh? I'm waiting on God. No, you're not. You're three steps ahead of God. And you're going in the wrong direction. So she took Hagar and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. After Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan. It's about 85 years old now. So he went into Hagar and she conceived. So it, it, it wasn't Sarah. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. You see, our thoughts and our ways are not only lower, they will create problems. Our thoughts and our ways will create circumstances. Our thoughts and our ways will create headaches that could last a lifetime. 
repercussions that will affect us, our loved ones, and even generations to come. And that's exactly what became of Ishmael. The Lord said, he is your son, I will bless him, but he will be a wild man. His hand will be against everyone in the world, and everyone in the world will be against him. That's exactly what's happened. Because somebody saw things that were true, but they were also incomplete. Verse 5 is pretty important. Verse 5 says, Then Sarah said to Abram, Que bonito, listen to this. My wrong be upon you. That's like when your spouse apologizes to you and says, I'm sorry you're so stupid. Not that my wife ever talks to me like that, but. Like, is that really an apology? And, like, and it was just, my wrong? She's apparently taking blame, but my wrong be upon you. What? I, 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 that's probably, I, I, I just did what you told me to do. I gave you my maid into your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between you and me. You want to know what I saw here? The same people who lead you away from God's thoughts and God's plans are the first ones to blame you for the results. Listen to the New Living Translation, how Sarah said it to Abram. Then Sarah said to Abram, This is all your fault. But wow, where you're like, this was your idea. But he, he, he's quiet here. Like he, he's a smart man after 85 years. It's better just to, to, to take the, the bombardment of insults and not say a word. I think it speaks of picking and choosing our, our battles, right? But if there was ever a time to say something, it'd be now. But he didn't. He just said, well. But now that she's pregnant, she treats me with contempt. The Lord will show who's wrong. You or me. Because somebody's wrong here. Thirteen years later. Please, no no show of hands. But married couples, is there ever an argument that you remember that you you wish you could forget, but you you, you can't forget? I've, I've I've got a couple. I've got a couple where I've seen a side of her that, thank God, none of you have ever seen. Porque da miedo. (laughs) You see her nice and quiet and humble. Anybody else married to the nice and quiet type? Those those are the ones you wash out. 13 years later, that's like an argument. You, You don't forget. You don't forget that day. But 13 years later, when Abraham was 9, can you say that with me, 99? 99 years old. This is around that time where where Sarah said, he's good at that. (laughs) Abraham went. God decides that it's time for his thoughts and his plans to be known. 99-year-old man. I said this last time I shared, and I'll say it again. God discloses the information he wants to disclose at the moment he feels it's necessary. We are in a need-to-know basis with God, and I thank God for that. I thank God for that, that he shows me in part and speaks to me in part, as a whole. I'm I'm saying as a whole. There's some areas that I would like to say, Lord, show uh, show me what, what my life will be like in a year from now. There's areas I, I have that with God. But I can thank God that as a whole, he determines the information that I can handle and that I need to know. Because the information that comes from God, you and I can't handle it if we're not ready for it. What happened to my page here? All right, we're getting, we're getting to the end here. 
So 13 years later, God says to him, I'm ready now. And then God begins to speak all these promises over Abram. Listen, Ishmael is not the one, you, the, the, the son from a bondwoman is not it. You are going to have a son with Sarah. What? So God tells him everything. God tells Abraham what's in his heart for him. How many of you would like to know what everything that's in God's heart for you? Right? Like if I hear that, I would say, yeah, sign me up. Yeah, put, put me in line. I'm number two after it easy. God begins to just unleash all his promises, all his blessings, his thoughts, his plans concerning you, and just lays them all out before you the way he did with Abram. So what does Abram do? Does he offer up another sacrifice? Chapter 17, verse 17. What does Abram do? How does he respond to the blessings, the promises, the provision, the exaltation that God has for him? Abraham fell on his face and laughed. When was the last time you laughed so hard you fell on your face? Like some of you, I can never picture that happening to you. Abram's response to God was that he laughed so hard, he fell on his face. And he said in his heart, Pake, just say it already. You've already insulted God. He says in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Like off the cuff, if somebody asks you, can that happen? You'd be like, no. <laughs> That's not good. It's not time to go yet. Not time for Pastor Javi to go yet. We still got some time. <laughs> Listen, I'm 100 years old and my wife is 90. How is this going to happen? Verse 18. Here he goes. It's like we don't learn. Here he goes. Offering up an option B. An alternate plan, alternate thoughts. God, I've got a thought. Abraham said to God, verse 18, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Not only my, my son Ishmael, but that he would be the promise. Why do you think Abraham said Ishmael? Because it was easier. It was more convenient, and it was already done. <laughs> like, hey, use this. Use him. I want to let you know that God doesn't care about any of those things. God doesn't care that it's easier. God doesn't care that it's more convenient. God doesn't care that you've already done it and screwed things up. God is committed to his thoughts and his plans concerning you. Nothing else. And nothing less. Verse 19, and I invite you to stand with me. Then God said. What does God say? No. Raise your hand if you've heard God say to you, no. No. If it was me, I would have said, absolutely not. Then God said, no. But Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him, not with your plans, not with your thoughts. I establish my covenant with my thoughts and with my plans, is what God said. For an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. Again, how many of you here God has said no to? You know that, you know that voice very well. Raise your hand. If God says no to you, he has something better for you. Every time that God says no, it's because he has something better. 
As I close, I want to remind you. If God's plans and God's thoughts are not making much sense to you right now, and you've made the mistake of praying for signs, I'm here to tell you there's nothing wrong with signs. But signs cannot come close to the word of God. Signs can't come close to a word from God in due season. Signs don't come close to the living word that enters your life when God speaks directly into that life of yours. Isaiah says, I just want you to listen to this. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and they do not return there, but they water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my what? My word. So shall my word that goes from my mouth, it shall not return to me void. And it shall accomplish what who pleases? What God pleases. And it shall prosper in the thing which I have sent it. See, God's word arrives to your life because it was sent by God. And God's word is on a mission for your life and mine. Signs can't do that. There is not a sign you're praying for that can do that. Stop praying for a sign and start praying for a word from God. No sign can do what God's word can do. A sign is for people who need their fears settled. A word is for those people who are ready to attain God's thoughts and God's plans for their life. And I ask you today, Will that be you? Will you be the type of person that follows hard after the thoughts and the plans of God? Would you be that person who's going to wait and not look at the situation that is true, but come to a conclusion because it's incomplete? Would you be that person who waits on a word from the Lord and once they receive that word from the Lord, everything changes? Listen, Abraham was not a perfect person. He was a flawed person. He was a flawed man. <laughs> There's not a person in scripture besides Jesus Christ that wasn't flawed. Man, woman, or child. Not a one. But the great ones? The great ones understood that God had thoughts and plans that were much higher than anything they could ever imagine. And they took their thoughts and plans and put them to the side and decided to go hard after God's thoughts and God's plans. I want to be that person. Do I have any friends? Right there where you are. Could you raise your hand with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, look at your people, oh God. Look at, look at us, Lord, with, with all our faults, with all the mistakes we've made, with all the plan Bs and Cs and Ds and Es we've presented before you in hopes that you would change your mind concerning your thoughts and your plans. Thank you, Lord, for being true to the thoughts and plans you have concerning us. Right there where you are, could you just thank God that he's never wavered from his thoughts and his plans concerning you? Can you thank God for the no's that he's brought to your life? Where he says no? But you shall do this. No, but I have this. Thank you, Lord, for the no's. Thank you for the disappointments that we thought were disappointments, but it was just you sparing us. For the no's that we were upset about, but you were just protecting us. For the times we've cried out and cried out and asked, and you said no. Because you had something that we couldn't even imagine. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Bring a word to your people. A word to those who are frustrated. A word to those who don't see clearly. A word to those who think there's no way. A word to those who have lost hope. And I pray, oh God, that if it's your will, you would just give them a glimpse, a glimpse, a glimpse of 
your thoughts and your plans concerning them. That'll be enough, oh God. A glimpse of what you have for us and your word, there is nothing that will stand in our way. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your people because even though we are flawed, even though we've attempted to present you with more ideas or what we consider to be better ideas, easier things, convenient things, things we've already done. Thank you for putting those things aside and saying to us that you are committed to your thoughts and your plans concerning us. That we be people who live for that, who strive for that, and who will glorify you through every experience we face on this side of eternity. We love you, Lord, and we honor you. And together we say amen and amen. God bless you all. Greet one another in the love of the Lord. Say hello to somebody you do not know this morning. Enjoy this weekend, but please remember what it really is all about. God bless you all.